Hi, and thanks for watching. As you know, Palm Sunday is just a few days away. And I don't think we often stop to consider just how provocative Palm Sunday is. Religiously, politically, theologically, this was one of the most provocative actions that Jesus performed. He was, of course, constantly challenging the religious authorities of the day. But what happened on Palm Sunday ranks pretty close to the top. So what I want to do is take a look at some archaeological evidence from the first century. I want to also take a look at some text from the Apocrypha that's going to help us to understand the symbolism of the, of the palms and how they were connected with the, the Jewish desire for independence. And I want to kind of set the stage to help us understand the political climate in which this, this happened. Jesus rides into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, but it's as if he's riding on the back of a powder keg that's about to explode. So in this video, I hope that we're going to have a better understanding of exactly what was happening on Palm Sunday and why it's so significant for, significant for us to, to understand that so that we can grasp the import of what Jesus communicated both in the text that were cited as well as in the, the symbols associated with it. To, to help us better grasp what was what was leading up to the events of, of Holy Week. So to begin with, as, as peop, most people probably know, uh, at this time Judea was under the control of, of the Roman. It was the Romans. It was part of the, the vast Roman Empire. And one particular symbol of the fact that the Jews were under the, the authority of the Romans and had been since Pompey captured Judea in 63 BC, one particular symbol of this was what was known as the Antonia Fortress. So you're looking at an image of it right now. This is a, the temple in Jerusalem and built just directly north of the temple, adjacent to it, was the Antonia Fortress. This, this was either, either built or at least refurbished and enlarged by Herod the Great in the first century BC. And as you can tell, one of the, one of the towers in the Antonia Fortress is actually higher than the temple courts so that the Roman garrison, which was stationed in the Antonia Fortress, could look down on the temple courts and police what was going on there. So it, it, was, it was where the Roman garrison in Jerusalem was stationed. It was just kind of a, a constant reminder right there next to this holiest place of the Jews, a constant reminder of the, of the Roman occupation and the control even, even, of, the, even of the temple courts. So that was, that was one reminder, constant reminder for the Jews that they were not independent. Even though they had some religious independence, they were part of the Roman Empire and they were governed by the, the Roman authorities. Now, at this particular time, leading up to Holy Week, and of course on Palm Sunday, and for, for some years prior to this, the, the Roman prefect or procurator of Judea was Pontius Pilate. Of course, we know him from the gospel story. We know him because he's part of the, the Christian creed that Christ was crucified under, under Pontius Pilate. But who was he? And how does this kind of help us to understand the political climate of the day? Well, Pontius Pilate, as I said, was the prefect of the procurator. So he was kind of the face of Rome in Judea. He was the one responsible for making sure that taxes were collected, for stomping out any rebellions which cropped up among the Jews. And, and like many of these procurators, Pontius Pilate made a mess of things quite often because he was, he was doing things that would provoke the Jews. It was as, it was as if the Romans didn't, didn't quite understand exactly how to govern the Jews. They didn't understand their, their, their religion. They didn't understand their culture. And so they often did things which, which upset the people that they were ruling over. For instance, Pontius Pilate, we know from, from other sources that he, he uh, collected funds from the temple to build an aqueduct. So he took temple money in order to construct this aqueduct. Uh, we know that at one point he almost incited a rebellion by uh, almost bringing Roman standards into Jerusalem, which would have been antithetical to the Jews because of the, of the Roman eagle. And we know that uh, finally he uh, was actually basically fired from his job. He was recalled to Rome because of accusations leveled against him for just viciously stomping out a group in, in Samaria. 
Uh, we have archaeological evidence for, for Pontius Pilate, by the way, in what uh, is often called Pilate's Stone. Uh, this was a limestone block. It was, it was found in an amphitheater in Caesarea. And you can, you can still see the words on the right-hand side, Pontius Pilate, Prefect of Judea. This was probably part of a, a dedication of a building that was constructed by Pilate to honor, honor Tiberius. So uh, Pontius Pilate is, is the procurator. Uh, Judea and the Jews are under the authority of the Romans. So how did the Jews react to this? Well, you, you, you kind of had three different perspectives among the Jews. You had, you had some who were kind of on the left, we might say. They were friendly to Rome. Uh, they were willing to accommodate the Romans quite a bit. These were sometimes called the, the Hellenizing Jews. And then you had a lot of people who were just kind of in the middle, right? They, just, they were Jews who wanted to live their lives and to practice their religion without Rome getting in the way. And then you had the group on the right, and these were often called the Zealots. They were just biting at the bit for any chance to rebel against the Romans. They were, they were fomenting rebellion any chance they could get. And it would eventually be uh, the Zealots and, and other factions which would lead to the, the Great Jewish Revolt, which would eventually then lead to the, the capture of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple in, in 70 AD. So that's, that's, kind of the, that's kind of the political climate in which Palm Sunday took place. And it's important to, to keep that in mind because Jesus wasn't just riding into a Jewish city. He was riding into a Roman city. He was riding into the, the city of Jerusalem that was controlled by the Roman government. And so when he is hailed as king, this was basically a slap in the face to Caesar because the Jews were not acknowledging the Roman emperor as king, but they were acknowledging Jesus from Nazareth as, as their king. So if the authorities have been paying any attention to what happened when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, they would have realized that this guy was indeed a threat to them. Now, to understand one aspect of the story, the palm branches, we need to talk about another couple of Jewish rebellions. Uh, the first one is going to take us backwards in history to the second century BC. So if, you, if you're a little bit familiar with Jewish history, you probably know about the, the Maccabean revolt. revolt. This was a, a revolt that was begun by a priest by the name of Mattathias. He was from the, the Hasmonean family, and he and his four sons were responsible for leading a, a war that that eventually resulted in the Jews for a, about a hundred years gaining either full or semi-independence from the Seleucid rulers of the day. Now, if you, if you go forward a little bit to, to 140 BC, one of these four brothers, one of these four sons of Mattathias by the name of Simon, he entered into Jerusalem in 140 BC and there, was, there was still a group that were opposed to the Jews that were holding out in the citadel known as the Acre. And this particular text we're looking at from 1 Maccabees 13, part of what's called the Apocrypha, is going to recount what happened when Simon entered into Jerusalem. Now pay attention for the presence of palms in this particular story. It says the men in the citadel, that's the Acre, in Jerusalem, were prevented from going out to the country and back to buy and sell. So they, they were hungry and many of them were perishing from famine. So they cried out to, to Simon, the Hasmonean, that, to make peace with them. And he did so. It says he expelled them from there. He cleansed the citadel of its pollutions. This happened in the second month in the 171st year. And it says the Jews entered it with praise and palm branches, palm branches. And with harps and cymbals and stringed instruments and with hymns and songs, because a great enemy had been crushed and removed from Israel. So from this text from the Apocrypha, 1 Maccabees, and connected with the, uh, the entry into Jerusalem of Simon, who was to become not only the, the political leader, but the high priest of the Jews, this event is associated with, with palm branches. Palm branches are, are becoming this the symbol of the Jews' desire for national independence, for breaking free of whatever authorities had foreign powers, had authority and dominion over them. Now, that's, that's one particular story. Let's jump ahead from the Apocrypha to a little bit of archaeology, to some, some coinage from the first century. So 
after the events of, of Palm Sunday and Holy Week, fast forward a few decades to the, the second of half of the first century, and we enter in, into what's called the Great Jewish Revolt. This was from about 66 AD, finally climaxing in, in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. Now, during this Great Jewish Revolt of the Jews against the Roman authorities, they issued some, some coins every year. And in the right before they actually lost this war, in, in about 69 or 70 AD, they issued a number of coins, bronze coins. These were a fraction of a shekel. And one of the symbols on these coins was a palm branch, or sometimes called a lulav, which was palms that were joined to, to other kinds of foliage. And the, therefore, the, on these coins, which were uh, minted by the Jews striving for independence from Rome, you have, once more, a palm branch. So from the time of the Maccabees uh, in, in the 2nd century B.C., to the first century AD, you had these, the symbol of the Jews that was associated with their desire to break the bonds of foreign domination and to once more be a free Israel. Now keep that in mind when you think about this Sunday that's named after palms. It's not an exact analogy, but it's kind of like a nation waving its, its national flag the symbol of, of independence and freedom. That's kind of what the palm branches were. So when, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, the people waving the palm branches, this was, this was symbolically associated with rebellion and with the desire to break free of the foreign domination, in this case, from the Romans. Because palm branches weren't really associated with, with Passover. They were associated with the fall festival of Sukkot, but not with Passover. So we have to explain their presence here. And I think this symbolic connection of, of palm branches and the desire for national independence fits here. So when the Jews greeted this king, this son of David, they waved palm branches like people they might wave a flag. This was their way of symbolizing that they wanted this son of David to bring them the independence that they desired. So that's the palm branches. Now, let's talk just a minute about Passover. Uh, you're probably most familiar with Passover. It's, uh, it's, most of you are familiar with it. It's, the, it's one of the three major Jewish festivals of, of, the, of the Jewish liturgical year. During Passover, the ordinary population of Jerusalem, which was around 50, 60,000 people, that would double or triple in size because people from all over Judea would come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. We also probably have a few Jews that came from the diaspora, kind of spread out over the Roman Empire, maybe once or twice in their lifetime. If they were able to make the journey, they would come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. So the, the, the point is that Jerusalem was, was bursting at the seams with people on Palm Sunday. So Jesus wasn't just riding in on any particular day, but he was riding into a city that was full of people and many of these people would have been kind of fired with this spirit for independence because Passover itself, of course, is, is, has its roots in God's freeing of his people from foreign domination. Of course, they were slaves in Egypt and God through Moses led them into, into freedom. So Passover has this, always has kind of this, this undertone of this desire to break free from domination. So this would have kind of been in the air. And not to mention the fact that, that Jesus himself, shortly before this, had just raised a man from the dead. He had raised Lazarus just right outside the city of Jerusalem. And so his fame was, was, was spreading. And this was still in people's minds when he rode into, into Jerusalem right before the Passover. Now, he rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. Now, I, I want to... I want to challenge the, the conception that people often have that the reason Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey was because he was wanting to, to ride in not on a, not on a horse connected with, with worldly power, but with a donkey that was not associated with worldly power. Well, there might be a, a, a little bit of truth to that, but I think the greater truth is found by looking at the symbolism of the donkey in Israel's past. Of course, the Jews knew their scriptures. They were immersed in these biblical stories. They were swimming in these scriptural accounts. They, they knew the Old Testament like the back of their hand. Well, where are donkeys as part of this 
this particular uh, uh, Jewish Jewish history? I mean, where where does the donkey fit in? Well, it fits in quite prominently because if you go back to the to the reign of King David, David is is on his deathbed, and he has chosen Solomon as his successor, and Solomon is the chosen successor to King David. And so what happens in 1 Kings chapter 1 is that David instructs his servants to, to place Solomon on his own mule and to bring him to the spring Gihon and to anoint him there as king. And that's what the people did. It says that everyone went after Solomon. They played flutes. They rejoiced with great joy. So the very earth was shaking with, with the noise. Solomon, the son of David, rides on donkey, uh, David's own donkey into the city of Jerusalem as the anointed king. Now, anyone who knew who Jesus was and watched what he did and listened to the crowds chanting that he was the king and that he was the son of David, it would have been almost impossible for any Jew to miss the fact that this event was connected with what happened back during the life of King David. This was not Solomon. This was the son of David, the promised Messiah, who himself was riding on a donkey, just like Solomon, the son of David, rode into the donkey, rode on a donkey into Jerusalem in order to take his throne as the anointed king. So, once more, this is extremely provocative because here is this, me this messianic an anointed king of Israel who is the new son of David come to establish his kingdom in Israel and to spread to the uttermost ends of the earth. If that's not provocative, then I don't know, I don't know what is. So Christ is this son of David. He's prophesied way back in 2 Samuel chapter 7. This is why the Messiah is called the son of David. So Solomon was kind of a preview to this, but God had explicitly promised David in 2 Samuel 7 that he would raise up David's seed after him. And through this seed, through this son of David, he was going to establish a kingdom which would have no end. So Jesus riding on a donkey was like him riding upon David's throne. He was coming as this promised son of David in order to be the one who would reign over this kingdom that would have no end. A, new, a newer and a greater Solomon had arrived. And not only do you have kind of the symbolism of the, of, of the palms that are associated with this desire for national independence, kind of a Jewish flag, if you will, of the day. Not only do you have Jesus riding upon this donkey, which was David's David, David's throne, more or less. You also have these texts that are either quoted by the evangelist or that are sung by the people when Jesus rides into Jerusalem. So this is their way of kind of giving us a, uh, an interpretation, a sung interpretation of the event. One of these is Psalm 118. Psalm 118 is part of the, the great Hallel, which is Psalms 113 through 118. There was, these were often uh, chanted by the Levitical choirs at these great Jewish festivals. And there's one particular verse that is sung by, by the crowds from Psalm 118 when Jesus rides into, rides into Jerusalem. And there we hear these words, Save us, this is from Psalm 118, Save us, we pray, O Lord, or Hosanna, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. So when John in chapter 12 quotes the people saying this, he, he tells us they took these branches of the palm trees and they cried out to Jesus, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. So Hosanna is a Hebrew word that uh, has worked its way into English and of course a lot of other languages as well. Hoshiana in Hebrew would be pronounced and it means save us, save us now. It's formed actually from the same verb from which we get the name of Jesus, Yasha. Yasha is to deliver or to save in Hebrew. So Hoshiana is save us now. And as if in direct fulfillment of that, as if in a direct answer to that particular song prayer, Hosanna, there is Jesus. There is the Savior. He is the one who's come to bring about this liberation for, for the people. So in singing Psalm 118, in singing Hosanna, 
and calling Jesus the king of Israel, they are saying that he is the one who's come to save Israel. He is the one who's the new king, the promised Messiah. So that takes place with the people singing Psalm 118. But we don't only have that, we also have the evangelist, including John, quoting from the prophet Zechariah, who was a 6th century Israelite prophet. And one of the things that he spoke about was the coming of the Messiah. So from Zechariah chapter 9, we hear these words. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. And the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations. And his rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So when Jesus rides into Jerusalem, and this is in fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 9, this is one more way of making sure that people realize that this is indeed the promised king, the promised Messiah. He's riding, according to Zechariah, on a donkey. And this donkey is the way that David's reign is, is symbolized, right? Just like we saw with the reference back in 1 Kings and Solomon. But he doesn't come in order to make war. He comes actually to end war. He comes to speak peace to the nations, it says, to establish a kingdom that's going to, to, to reach the utter ends of the earth. And that's why the war horse is mentioned there. He doesn't, he doesn't come to make battle, uh, even though war is waged against him, but he comes instead to establish a kingdom of peace that's going to reach the uttermost ends of the earth. So Christ is humble, he's lowly, but the animal which he rides upon is a symbol of, of his regal nature, of the fact that he comes to establish himself as the king. This donkey, by the way, is, it reaches all the way back in the Jewish scriptures to Genesis chapter 49. Uh, Jacob on his deathbed was blessing his 12 sons, and when he blessed his son Judah, he connected Judah with rule over his people and with a donkey. So when Zechariah is, is, is prophesying, he's probably reaching back all the way to Genesis 49 to talk about this Messiah from the tribe of Judah who's going to ride on a donkey to establish the kingdom of his father David, which is going to reach to the ends of the earth. So th there's, there's a lot that's going on on Palm Sunday and a lot that is extremely provocative and purposely so. Of course, it was, was misunderstood by many of the people. Jesus did not come to establish some sort of national independence, but he came to establish a kingdom of forgiveness and grace for all. He didn't come just to, to kind of throw off the Roman domination. He came to destroy all the powers of evil. He didn't come to start some sort of political movement. He came to establish the kingdom of God on earth in which all earthly rule and authority would be eventually destroyed because this kingdom would cover the ends of the earth and then this kingdom would be finally leading to the resurrection and to the establishment of a new heavens and a new earth where the kingdom of God would be there for all those who believe, all those who trust in, in the Messiah. So there's, to kind of summarize this, why Palm Sunday is so provocative. You first of all have the setting. It's the Passover setting with its overtones of liberation from bondage to foreign powers and this implicit desire for God to make good on his promises through the prophets of a second exodus in the, in, in the Messiah. That's, this sets the stage for why this act of Jesus is so provocative. But you also have the symbols. You have the palm leaves that are associated with the Maccabean revolt and the desire for independence. And they were, they were emblematic of this Jewish hope in the Messiah who would usher in the kingdom of God. And you also have the symbols of, of the donkey, which is connected with David and Solomon. This marked the mount of the messianic son of David who would bring peace to Israel. And then finally, you have the evidence from the scrolls, from the scriptures. Old Testament texts like Psalm 118 and, and Zechariah 9, Isaiah 40 with the phrase fear not figures in here as well. And then Genesis 49, where you have Jacob's prophecy about the, the one who comes from the tribe of Judah to rule over his people. So all of this together 
is, is, is the message of Palm Sunday. It shows us exactly how provocative this day would have been. And it shows us that Jesus rides into Jerusalem quite purposely to say, I am the Messiah and I've come to establish my kingdom. Now, the way that kingdom was established, as we hear through the rest of Holy Week, was not what anyone expected. But this is what the Messiah came to do. He came to bring the kingdom of God as the new son of David for us. Now, I hope that has been helpful to you as we come upon Palm Sunday. Thanks for watching. If you like this, if you found this helpful, just please share this with others. And may God bless your Palm Sunday celebrations. I know most of us are going to be at home, but uh, celebrate at home and, uh, and listen, to, listen to a service on a live stream or Facebook Live or whatever it might be to be able to participate in Palm Sunday. Just because we're home doesn't mean that we can't, can't still celebrate this, this highly significant day in, in the life of Christ. So again, thank you so much. God bless you. Uh, be healthy. Be safe. And I will see you next week with my next video.